Located way at the top of Lake Superior, Thunder Bay is a jewel of the Great Lakes. This area has been known as the Lakehead by many people, and that was actually one of the options for names back in the 1960s, losing out by a narrow margin to Thunder Bay. Though the university here still bears the name to this day. It's the largest city in the region, and therefore a hub for everything from commerce to concerts. If you visit, a must is to try and come for the annual Thunder Bay Blues Festival. It's been a rite of summer here for years, and seems to get better as it ages. Located right here at Marina Park, along the waterfront, and fittingly, just steps from the marina, if you're into an epic boat trip, you should time your arrival for early July. The year we were there, it was an all-Canadian lineup, and included in the impressive lineup was Alan Doyle and the beautiful gypsies, and the Bare Naked Ladies, from my hometown of Scarborough, Ontario. And to keep them on screen for just a second longer, here's a totally useless fact for you. The bassist, Jim Cregan, and I both went to the same high school. The next morning, with the music still in my head, I wandered to the marina to meet up with our local hosts, but got sidetracked by the cutest little powerboat TV fan around. The city-owned marina is located within Prince Arthur's Landing at Marina Park and has 271 slips, fuel docks, launch ramps, and room for transients. And it's right downtown. The location doesn't get much better than this. Knowing nothing of the area and being entirely too lazy to Google it myself, I asked our hosts, Scott and Kristen, to arrange a sailing plan for us that could show some local highlights. And local knowledge is always best, after all. So we headed southwest, past the massive grain silos and commercial port. Well, it's kind of neat, as you mentioned, with the commercial shipping port and active port here, not everybody gets to see big freighters up close. And it's kind of fun when they're out on anchor. You can take guests out there and kind of motor up pretty close to them and you get an idea of how immense they actually are, which is kind of fun. And uh, to watch them maneuver around is really quite amazing. To fit into the small slips at the elevators, there isn't a lot of space. And so with that comes tugboats. We get to, there's two active uh, tugboat companies in town, so we get to see them work at a pretty regular basis. Scott Merkley's day job is as a police detective. Therefore, he spends a lot of time at the donut shop, possibly the most perfect boat name around. Scott's had boating in his blood since he was a kid out on the lake in smaller fishing boats. As for larger boating, when I moved to Thunder Bay about nine years ago, I bought my first larger boat, which she was a 24-foot bay liner. And I decided I wanted something a little bigger to explore a few more spots that were more safe. So since then, we bought this Silverton, and we've had her for about six years. And we've traveled lots. We put on about a 1,000 nautical miles a season. Lots of places nearby, down to Bayfield, Wisconsin, the Apostle Islands, over to Isle Royale, Michigan. We pretty much touched on everywhere within, you know, a couple hundred miles of Thunder Bay here, and it's, uh, we really enjoy it. It's our summertime hobby. We spend a lot of time on board. Safe to say, I've got the right guides to show me around. Beyond the break walls protecting the port of Thunder Bay is the omnipresent Sleeping Giant, the rock formation that looks like, well, a sleeping giant. But we'll come back to that later. Continuing along, we head for Pie Island, and Scott lets me take the helm. No mere landmark for other journeys, unto itself, it is magnificently majestic. With a height of more than 425 meters, or 1,400 feet, but a relatively small footprint of only 46 square kilometers, or 18 square miles, the rocky center juts up abruptly from the tree-lined shore. It's a must-photo kind of place. Continuing along, we're about 30 kilometers or 17 miles from the marina when we come upon an island blanketed in a seemingly isolating fog. As we came around the top of South McKellar Island, we saw an opening. Scott told me that this is actually an abandoned mine. And as much as I wanted to pull up and find a way to explore it, we had far too much to see and far too much water to cover. Later in the show, when we return to Thunder Bay, we'll get up close and personal with the island and one of the single coolest and most remote harbors I've ever been to.
Welcome back to Thunder Bay and here, out on Lake Superior. We've come into this long, sheltered bay that's long been a favorite spot for local boaters. And when we arrived early in the morning, there were already a few others here, including some of the finest folks in the world, Powerboat TV viewers. You're the reason why I bought this last year. Yeah? You are. Nice. Isn't it fun? <laughs> to me, this is the best of boating. The docks have been made and maintained by volunteers for years, and it's one of the cleanest I've ever seen. There's a true sense of community here. But I was told we had to go check out the sauna, so we went for a walk, with me being pretty sure I misheard. Well, so here's the sauna. It's always nice and warm and in it's there, a, and it's, uh, oh, it's a wood-fired. Not, not a lot of places you can travel out into the That's so vast cool. lake superior. And since you're here, yeah, you, yeah. Just, you gotta sign the logbook. Beauty. Legit. Perfect. Now you can officially say you've been to Thompson Island. And you have proof. It's in the book. Now, see ya. There's a trail up to a nice lookout that if it weren't so foggy, would give a clear view to Isle Royal in Michigan, which is about 22 kilometers or 12 nautical miles away. Even still, the harbor is deflecting most of the fog overhead, so at water level, it's nice and clear, almost as clear as the water. So how deep is it? Here, I think it said it was six feet when I pulled in. Crystal clear. Yeah, it's really cool. Like the guys that have underwater lights at night, it's really groovy. See all this fish swim up. <laughs> yeah. But there's lots more to see. So we say our goodbyes and leave Thompson Island. And once again, have to navigate the thick fog that's hovering around here, thanks to the cold water mixing with the hot July air. Once we left the protection of Ray Bay on Thompson Island, we were back out in the rough water. Following the GPS through the thick fog, but still taking in the rocky scenery along the way. As we made our way out of the rocky island shoreline, the fog began to dissipate, revealing something pretty spectacular. These giant cliffs behind me are arguably the most famous natural landmark of Thunder Bay. This is actually Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, but we're so close, it doesn't look like a sleeping giant. It just looks like giant cliffs. And it's quite awesome in the literal definition. The trees along the shoreline are huge, and they're still hundreds of feet above them. Cruising along here should be on anyone's Thunder Bay boating bucket list, because this is a view you're only going to get by boat. Now, it's a little rocky rolly right now, so we're going to continue and tuck in to Sawyer's Bay, which is a popular anchorage for local boaters. But even with these little waves and rollers, this is pretty pristine. Rounding the point that makes the head of the sleeping giant, we're into Sawyer Bay. And this old shack here pretty much taps out the development along this part of the waterfront. It's the remnants of an old fishing camp. It's sheltered enough today to keep the waves down, but the wind is still rocking along pretty good. Then again, that's the only noise you'll find out here today. And compared to the rock and fun of the Blues Festival, this is pretty cool. We're at the height of summer, but because there's so much water out here and so many bays, and it's not the most populated area in the world, everywhere you go, you have peace and quiet and solitude, which is pretty rare and pretty nice in the middle of summer. But with the sun sinking, we decided to call it a day and do the 26 kilometer or 14 nautical mile run back from the bed of the sleeping giant to the marina. And it's a good stretch of open water to cross, even though it's a bay. So I'm glad Scott had traded up in size of boats a few years back. Maybe an older Silverton, but it's a smooth runner, even through the chop. To prove it, he even let me drive it again. Make this the fourth Great Lake I've driven a boat on. Lake Michigan, take note, you're next on my hit list. Next week, we're gonna stay in Thunder Bay and we'll head up the Kaministiquois River, another local gem. 
That is, if I can ever get my body temperature down after the sauna. Jesus, that thing's on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh Bad idea. Oh. <laughs> Glasses are all fogged up. Uh, it's craziness. Welcome back to Thunder Bay. Last week, we explored a loop of the region's greatest boating hits, going past stunning Pie Island to the unique Bay Harbor on Thompson Island, 17 miles from the marina. And up close and personal with the Sleeping Giant. Today, far away from the Sleeping Giant, we again met our local hosts, Scott and Kristen, at their boat at the marina, which is located right downtown at Prince Arthur's Landing at Marina Park. After discussing who needed the coffee more, we were ready to rock. So a little cloud cover, no big deal, but uh, day two of the cruise, Scott, you're fired as captain. Kristen, you're taking over. Woo! Taking us up to Cam and Nistiqua. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. But I can just call it the Cam. Yes, the camera. Cam works. <laughs> so pitter-patter, let's get at her. Nice day on the lake today, too. Of course, right? Yeah. Oh, got to be quiet. Don't wake the sleeping giant. That's the early lead for worst joke of the trip. <laughs> What's it like here? I get to go to a lot of marinas in different places, and I don't think it's a purposeful thing necessarily, but there does seem to be that, you know, uh, stereotype that it's often, you know, the man will be captaining the boat and the, the woman will be, you know, tending the lines and helping out. Is that something that, that you notice? Am, am I out of left field here? But it's nice to see, yeah. you know, a woman driving the boat and not just saying, oh, I'll do the lines. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I believe that that is commonly what you do see. Um, however, there has been, uh, that I've noticed locally, quite a change in um, the genders of people uh, captaining different boats and learning how to, you know, properly run a boat and navigate. I've some of the courses I've taken, there's been quite a few women that have been involved. And I, I find with our boat, it's just, it's, it's co-captaining, which is so beneficial for running a boat because both parties on the boat know how to run the boat if something should happen, an emergency, or just if you're going on these long trips, it, it's great to have somebody yeah, who can take over the helm and know what they're doing bit. and read a chart and and continue on our journeys. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. So we're gonna head up the Kamenistiqua River. Yes. So just tell me a little bit about where we go. And is this something that you do? Like, do you, do you guys do this cruise? Do you take friends? Or are you just doing this for us? We we often go up the Cam River. It's a beautiful trip up the river. We go all the way up to the outside of Old Fort William. It's often quite warmer than being on the lake. So sometimes with Lake Superior um, being unpredictable and mm. being quite windy out there, that's always a very comfortable trip to go up the river. Heading under the bridge to McKellar Island that Kristen's kids call the Fish Bridge for obvious reasons, you're officially in the river. There possibly might be a pelican behind us, behind you. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, there is a pelican. There's a pelican. Yeah, redeemed. Woo! <laughs> That's the difference between a good captain and a great captain. Now, I'm not naming names, but the other day when we were out on the lake, we were promised there'd be pelicans. Saw none. Today, not even two miles from the dock, three of them. Woo! Did you see them, Scott? There were three pelicans there. I saw them. <laughs> Continuing along with this stretch of water, it's packed with history, which, if you're a history nerd like me, is amazing. And if you're just a boater, it's still super cool, as there are some pretty unique sites along here, beyond just the local industry. First up is the James Whalen Tug now permanently moored at Kamenistiqua Riverfront Heritage Park that also features a vintage via rail train. This 950 horsepower beast could break ice 40 inches thick. Not bad for something made in 1906. A kilometer later, or one half nautical mile, is the Jackknife Bascule Bridge, which in my mind is a very complicated way of saying super funky lifty bridge. And it connects Mission Island to the mainland and, like the tugboat, is well into its second century. The difference, though, is that the bridge still operates. We had to have it raised to get our sedan bridge underneath, which was very cool to witness up close. It's no longer used for vehicles, but it's still used today as a rail bridge. A 
Later in the show, we'll continue up the river and back in history as we hit old Fort William. Welcome back to beautiful Thunder Bay on the northwest shore of Lake Superior. We've left the marina downtown, cruised into the mouth of the Kaministiqua River, past McKellar Island, and under the Jackknife Bascule Bridge. The wind has kicked up and is howling across Lake Superior like a Gordon Lightfoot song. But the cam is like a mirror today. The cliffs and trees lining the shoreline offering almost total protection, and to me, it's worth revisiting because I love boating, and what I love more is seeing others boat. But it's still a male-dominated pastime. For it to grow, we want more women at the helm, like Kristen. Go back for years. Like, when you first, first time you, sat, you, <laughs> yes. you sat where you are, what was that like? You know, a mix of emotions. It was, you know, you're nervous, but also very excited. So the more you get behind and practice and just get out in the water and apply the things that you've learned, you do become more comfortable, but you're always aware. Being aware constantly, looking around for any kind of hazards, and it's there's still things that um, I need to learn and uh, practice, but it's uh, it's so much better now. Four years ago, I would be worried, but where are we? Where are we going? Which way should I go? What side should I be on? But once you learn that and just you come out a few more times, it's much more comfortable. Donut shop, donut shop, donut shop. This is for Christ's sake, over. G Money, what's up, brother? Where are you guys? We're just uh, coming up to Bowwater right now. What are you guys doing? Like the TV host or what? <laughs> so because we have the camera here, you are now the official spokesperson for all aspiring women boaters. What would you say to women out there about why they should get behind the wheel and learn? It's an amazing experience. It's very empowering. And anybody can do it, male or female. Just give yourself the chance to try it and be with somebody who is very patient and wanting to teach you what to do. Just enjoy yourself. It's a great experience and very empowering to see more women behind the helm. Being a passenger instead of driving, which I often have to do, is awesome. And I was really able to soak up the scenery, which ranged from a massive pulp and paper mill to some waterfront homes and cabins. But the further up river you go, you're mostly on your own. And even on a mid-July day like this, you have a good chance of being the only boat on the cam for the three and a half mile run up to Old Fort William. The reason Thunder Bay even exists. So going back a little bit, even before Fort William is here, the Northwest Company, which is the company operating in this area in the early 19th century um, and late 18th century, um, were based out of Grand Portage, south of the border. After the American Revolution, years after that, they were sort of squeezed north um, and were told they were gonna have to pay duty on all goods coming across the border, so they needed to find another inland headquarters. So they moved to the mouth of the Kaministiqua River, which is where Fort William was built in 1803. The current location, featuring historical interpreters and a rebuilt version of the entire fort, is not at the original location at the mouth of the river, but rather it's at this new location further upriver. The purpose of Fort William is a transshipment point and inland headquarters of the Northwest Company. Uh, so what that means is you have canoe brigades every year when the ice goes out in the spring, the brigades are departing from wherever they're coming from, whether they are many of the posts out west or coming from Montreal, and they make the journey to Fort William and arrive here in the middle of July usually, at which point they exchange the, the goods they've brought, whether it's fur or trade goods, um, and head back to their respective place, back to Montreal or back into the interior out west. They can't make that journey without stopping at Fort William and breaking that long journey up. But don't make the mistake of thinking this is just some modern imagination of what it may have looked like, thanks to a rather fastidious officer who commissioned a detailed inventory of every building and all stores, this fort has been rebuilt to exact specifications how big each building was, its exact location, the floor plan, even the contents. I can tell you more about Fort William and what's in it than what's in my own house, I think. And with that waterfront connection and the rich heritage, this merits a visit by anyone in my mind, especially boaters. 
And for Scott and Kristen, this is a regular stop for their summer boating adventures. Like you guys have come here for, for festivals and concerts and mud runs and stuff like that, but like when you're touring either yourselves or with friends, um, do you just kind of come up here and this being the end of the line for the river, just loop around or do you, do you anchor, have lunch? Sometimes it's a little bit of both. Sometimes depending on time frames, we can, this is our spot where we turn around and head back casually to home. But a lot of times it's such a beautiful day like today, we like to put the anchor out on such a great set and have some snacks. Sweet. Are we done? I'm hungry, and they're right here, and they look good. Hey, Scott, cauliflower? Can I interest you? Yeah, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> Perfect. Love the cauliflower. Yeah, it's your favorite? It's my Thank favorite. you. Thanks. <laughs> Keep rolling. Keep rolling. You got to finish the whole thing. Mm, fantastic. <laughs> Here's a tip for everyone. If you're on the boat of a police officer who hates cauliflower, and you force him to eat it on camera, you get the stink eye the whole run back. But I stand by my move. And of course, once we're back and safely tied up, we can officially toast an amazing trip to the lakehead. A legend of water-based travel, old and new. Hey, cheers. Thanks, guys. That was awesome, cheers. Chris. It's what a great time. Thank it's you. Coming. Thanks for coming to Lake today. Captain, River Captain, yes. Pelican Finder, Pelican Hofer. <laughs> we're going to be branching out on Powerboat TV this year and doing deck and shed reviews. <laughs> First of all, there's your problem right there. You don't got no land underneath your shed. Um, well. That is the wrong answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's all the time we have for today. Yeah, back to you, Jim. <laughs> all right, take her back. No, no, we're done. <laughs> we're done. Okay, <laughs> see, see y'all next week. <laughs>